Good morning. My name is Elisa Bayumi, and I'm a Global Voices Metcalf Fellow, a resident of the International House, and a second year at the University of Chicago College studying political science. On behalf of my fellow residents, students, interns, and staff, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the International House at the University of Chicago and to today's event. I hope all of you will return to the International House throughout the remainder of the quarter to attend other Global Voices lectures and performances, including the Chicago Ensemble's first performance in their 42nd season being held here tomorrow, as well as the fifth International Korean Traditional Performing Arts Competition next Saturday. Founded in 1932 by John D. Rockefeller Jr. as a co-educational residence for students around the world, the International House serves as a cultural center for the metropolitan Chicago. The Global Voices Public Programming Series advances this goal by promoting cross-cultural understanding and opportunities for civic discourse on community, national, and, and world affairs. For over 86 years, International House has offered programs of music and dance performances, films, lectures, conferences, and roundtable discussions to the University of Chicago and the greater Chicago land. You can find more information about such upcoming events on the literature table in the front entrance. Please make sure to sign up for our mailing list in order to receive announcements about our upcoming events. Now, it is my honor to officially welcome you to the Chicago Humanities Festival and to this morning's program, Mary Nessel, Unsavory Truths. The Chicago Humanities Festival brings more than 120 programs a year to stages across the city. Join the conversation and get involved as a member, donor, or volunteer. Visit the chicagohumanities.org to learn more. The Terra Foundation for American Art is a leading partner of Graphic as part of the nation a citywide initiative Art Design Chicago. Following the program, please join us for a book signing in the lobby. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Marian Nessel, the Paulette Goddard Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health Emerita at the University of Chicago uh, at, the, at New York University. <laughs> <laughs> Too many universities. A consumer advocate and nutritionist, award-winning author, and academic who specializes in the politics of food and dietary choice. Her work examines scientific and societal influences, particularly the f role of food marketing on health consequences of food choice. She's the author of several pride-winning bo books, among them the Polit uh, Food Politics, Where to Eat, and most recently, Unsavory Truths, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat. She blogs almost daily at foodpolitics.com and tweets at Mary Nessel. We also have us with us today Ji Suk Yi, a features entertainment reporter and program host of the Grid web series featured on the Chicago Sun Times. The Grid visits and highlights the best food and must see pro spots in every neighborhood of Chicago. She is a weekly contributor at the Jam Morning Show on w uh, WCIU and formerly on ABC7 Windy City Live for seven seasons. Please help me in welcoming Marian Nessel and Ji Suk Yi. Thank you. Bring in your step, young lady. Hi, everybody. How are you? Hello. Thanks for coming out on a Saturday morning. You're having brunch with us, basically. It's going to be brunch for your mind and brunch for your soul. Um, Marion is amazing. I've fallen in love with her. We've been hanging out in the green room. We had fun. <laughs> Too much fun, I think. Um, OK, so we're going to have about 40 minutes of a conversation, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions. So be sure to hang on to that question that's burning in your mind. We will get to it, OK? I promise. Um, so Marion, you said that you had an exact, you know the exact date that you decided you were going to write this book. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it was August 11th, um, 2015, <clears throat> when the New York Times came out with a big article about how Coca-Cola was funding a group called the Global Energy Balance Network, um, which was arguing on television or on their website that it didn't matter what you ate or, drink or drank if you were worried about obesity. All you had to do was be active and not even that much more active. <laughs> um, and I, there was a, I was interviewed for that story. It was a whole page in the inside of the New York Times. 
And they ran my quote as a banner across the top of the article. Nobody could miss it. And I said, it was something like, oh, no, not again. Um, <laughs> I was, was well prepared for that. And I got calls from about 30 reporters that week, one after another after another. And the reporters were shocked. They said, really? Coca-Cola funds research like that? Really? Investigators would take money from Coca-Cola for doing those kinds of studies? Really? Universities allow their faculty to do this? I thought, I've got another book to write. <laughs> there it was. And I was well prepared because uh, the year before, or, or actually while this, while this was still going on, in, earlier in 2015, I started collecting on my website. Every time I came across five studies that were funded by a food company that came out with results favorable to the, con to the company's interest, I would post them on my website. I asked readers to send me examples of studies that were funded by a food company that did not come out with re <laughs> favorable results, but I didn't get very many of those. And at, <laughs> and at the end of the year, I had 168 studies that I'd posted, and 156 of them came out in favor of the company's interests. Only 12 didn't. Um, so by, that wasn't very systematic or scientific, but it certainly was clear that it's easier to find industry-funded studies with results favorable to marketing interests than it is to find them unfavorable. So I was quite prepared to take on this task. Um, I should mention, you should definitely check out Marion's uh, website. Foodpolitics.com. Yes. It's fabulous, just as Thank she you. is. You can tell she's very engaging. <laughs> I'm enthralled with her. She is our uh, nutrition goddess. Um, okay, so why do you think that this was so not on the radar of journalists? Well, I think journalists, like everybody else, doesn't think of food in the same category as pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical drugs or cigarettes. You just don't think of food that way. We need to eat to live. We love the products that the food company makes for us. Um, some of us loving them more than others, but we love them. And we don't think of the food industry, which provides products that we really like, as businesses. And the idea that food companies are businesses just like any other business, and their primary goal is not public health, it's not social service, their primary goal is to make money for stockholders, and they do that in exactly the same way as cigarette companies or pharmaceutical drug companies. And you said the key to that is they have to make money for stockholders, but it's not just about making a profit, but it's about increasing the profit year to year. Well, that's when everything started. Happening. I mean, in the early 1980s, the investment, along with a lot of things that changed, the investment system changed, and it went from valuing blue chip stocks like IBM that gave long, slow um, returns on investment um, to valuing, it's what, what happened was the, the shareholder value movement, which demanded that corporations produce immediate higher returns for stockholders, and that became the main goal for companies, was not only making profits, but making um, profits that grew every quarter, so you could report growth to Wall Street every quarter, that's hard for any corporation. But for food companies, it was devastating because we have twice as much food produced and available in this country as the population needs. So that creates a hugely competitive economic situation for food companies. And that's where all of this comes from, I think. Um, you mentioned the tobacco industry. Um, a lot of what the food industry employs, uh, they learned from the tobacco industry and something also called the playbook. The playbook, <laughs> the tobacco industry playbook. Um, yeah, it's a set of rules that was, were followed by tobacco industry uh, executives who by that time already knew that cigarette smoking was associated with a higher risk of lung cancer um, and yet, 
uh, did everything they possibly could to number one, cast doubt on the science, number two, discredit scientists who were producing work linking cigarettes to lung cancer, um, and then doing all the other kinds of things, funding research that would do the opposite, um, engaging in, in so-called educational campaigns, uh, recruiting front groups, uh, organizations that looked like they were independent but actually were paid for by the cigarette company to cast out on the science, cast out on the science. I mean, we see this all the time. It's still going on. Um, but the, the, lots of other industries picked that up, and they've done a really good job of picking it up, and the food industry was late coming to that because it was late needing to come to that, but it, it uses it pretty well. And it there's also an issue just inherently nutritional research and science is very complex. It's not easy to study food and humans, right? Well, I think that's the big problem that everybody understands is that needs to understand is how hard this research is to do. I mean, think, suppose we were going to do an experiment and we were going to give everybody on this side of the aisle one diet and everybody on this side of the aisle another diet. Um, but in order to control that, so you're not sneaking out into the cafeteria and getting something else and messing up the experimental protocol, we have to lock you up. <laughs> um, and probably because it takes a long time for dietary changes to in induce risk, we probably have to lock you up for 20 or 30 years um, <laughs> while we're feeding you these diets. You're not rats or mice. You're people who are eating diets of enormous complexity, and not only are your diets complex, and you're eating lots of different foods on any one day, um, but you're changing your diet from day to day. You don't eat exactly the same thing at exactly the same time every day. If you do, you're pretty unusual. Uh, and, the, and your stuff isn't defined. And then you do other things. You might smoke, you might drink, you might be minimally active, you might be extremely active. It's very, very difficult to control for all of the difference. And you have physiological and genetic differences, too. Um, but it's really hard to control for the things that are even controllable without locking you up for 20 or 30 years. We can't do those kinds of experiments. Now, you're very sympathetic, or you you know, you're, you're nice about your colleagues. Um, I try to be. <laughs> I like my I mean, colleagues. <laughs> yes, but I mean, there's, there's not much public funding out there for research. Mm. There's, so there's a reason why your colleagues are maybe taking money from the food industry. Sure. If you're doing science, um, you've got to pay for it, particularly if you're doing lab science of some kind or, or big population investigations. These are very expensive to do. You need to hire a lot of people to do the work. Um, you need lab equipment if you're doing lab studies. Uh, that money used to come mainly from the federal government uh, through the National Institutes of Health, but those budgets have been cut. And at some point when, as part of the pressure on food companies to get in, to increase their market share, they began looking for ways to fund their own research. They began offering research proposals. I get letters all the time from uh, trade associations associations for a particular product, the, the yogurt people, the pecan people, the pomegranate people, the whatever, asking for proposals for research to demonstrate the benefits of those products. There's a bit, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some chuckles throughout here. There's a big difference between asking for research to demonstrate benefits and asking for research to show what a product does. The difference between an open-ended question and a closed question. And so if they're asking for research proposals to show benefits, that's what they're going to get. And that research will be designed to show the benefit of those products. And then you can take that research, if you're a marketer, and advertise it and get health claims. Um, these are superfoods. 
Blueberries are a wonderful example. I have to say, I love blueberries. <laughs> I eat them every chance You've I get. You destroy them for me in this book. I now. love blueberries. <laughs> I have two blueberry trees on or, or bushes on my t 12th floor terrace in Manhattan. I don't have problem with deer, but I do have problems with birds. Um, I love blueberries, but are blueberries really a superfood? The main blueberry aso association was very concerned that the ground level blueberries that are grown in Maine, um, which have to be picked by hand and are really expensive and difficult to get, and um, that they were going out of business because nobody was buying them. They measured their antioxidant level. All fruits have antioxidants. They found antioxidants in blueberries, and they found some that were higher in blueberries than other fruits, and they were in marketing heaven. Um, do we need more antioxidants? Not if you eat fruits and vegetables generally. All fruits and vegetables have antioxidants. Um, they're sort of to keep off bad insects and things like that. Um, there's not much evidence that eating more antioxidants on top of an already reasonable diet does any good for you at all. And certainly the supplements have been shown in some cases possibly to cause harm. I love blueberries, but do they have to be marketed because of their antioxidants? Wait, did you say in some cases to show harm? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there have been Have you guys ever heard this before? This is like, oh, un sure. I, this oh, is sure. unbelievable. Sure they've heard it before. <laughs> yeah. I, no, but I mean, I go to the grocery store. <laughs> I go, go not, buy the Not the anti antioxidants, blueberries. Those are fine. Right. It's supplements. Yes, the supplements. Yes. Supplements. But I mean, when I go to the grocery store, I go and immediately go get the bright blueberries because I think mm -hmm. superfood. Then Yum. I think kale. Superfoods. Superfood. <laughs> and then I go get an almonds and I'm like, superfood. And then I go get dark chocolate. This is good for me, right? Dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Antioxidants. Oh, only if you eat a pound and a half of it a day. <laughs> But nobody ever told me that when they were reporting that on the news. And I read it in your book, and I was like, are you kidding me? I've I'm been putting sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I mean, I think it, all fruits and vegetables have antioxidants. Yes, dark chocolate has uh, antioxidants, but not very much. And the... Um, you know, yeah, eat more fruits and vegetables, but do they have to be superfoods? If you think of every fruit and vegetable as a superfood, you're in good shape. <laughs> and the, um, you know, the secret to healthy diets is variety of unprocessed foods. That's really all there is to it. Um, so anything that you pick in that part of the, sec of the section is good, and you want to eat the ones you like. I'm for it. But I, I don't like the marketing. I think yeah. it's deceptive. Well, uh, that's, or misleading. That's maybe, what you're saying. Maybe that misleading is better than deceptive. That the mm. science often is the marketing. Well, that's how it's used. Exactly. That's how it's used. Yeah. yeah. Um, OK, so let's talk about um, a little bit more about the superfoods. Um, and, and antioxidants. Um, can you talk a little bit about macadamia nut? I love macadamia nuts. <laughs> and I have to confess, I even like ma love macadamia nuts when they're smothered in chocolate. <laughs> dark um, chocolate. Dark chocolate. Yeah. Some, somebody from Hawaii just brought me some. I was really happy. Um, so the macadamia nut people wanted, uh, they weren't selling enough macadamia nuts. So they wanted a health claim. So they did research, or they sponsored research. I can't even remember what it was, but macadamia nuts have healthy fats in them, and healthy fats reduce the risk of heart disease. And they went to the, um, they had the research, went to the FDA, asked the FDA for a health claim uh, for macadamia nuts, and the uh, FDA gave them a qualified health claim. And a qualified health claim um, is something that says, something along the lines of, and I don't remember the exact words, but I, I put it in the book because I thought it was hilariously funny, something like, limited and inconclusive evidence based on studies with very small samples of individuals demonstrates, suggests that um, eating a certain number of macadamia nuts every day might possibly lead to, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I think, really? They went to all this trouble to get that? 
how do they use that? And they have it in tiny, tiny, tiny print on their ads. But you know what happens is that I heard on the news in a soundbite that macadamia nuts are incredible for you. They're a super great nut for you. You can eat them, healthy for you like almonds. And uh, so then I go to the grocery store and I spend the extra money to buy the expensive macadamia nuts. Mm, they're so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, see, it's her fault. Yes. She's a reporter. But, um, and reporters love stories like that. They just love stories like that. And so and of course the macadamia nut people why are we picking on them when I like them so much? <laughs> they, um, the macadamia nut people put out a press release. And there are reporters, certainly not G, who um, write their stories based on press releases. And so they just write up the press release, and the press release gets published in whatever the newspaper is. And I've got many, many examples throughout the book where there's the study, there's the reality, there's the press release, and there's the article. And there they are, one, two, three. It worked. Yeah. Well, Money well invested. Well, having worked in um, TV news especially, you know, you'll be doing stuff around the house, you kind of have the news on, and then the news will say, oh, find out which food will help you live longer. Yes. yes. Stick around. <laughs> you wait for the two commercial breaks, and it's the very last story. And then it ends up being macadamia nuts. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> macadamia, and the macadamia nut people do it, the almond people do it, the walnut people do it, the... Um, Cashew, their, their cashew studies, their peanut studies, every nut by this time, the pecan <laughs> people. I talk a lot about the pecan studies because I had this really terrific set of <clears throat> email and, con and phone conversations with this terrific executive director of the Pecan Association who was just wonderfully explicit about why they needed this research in order to try to increase market share for pecans. He thinks pecans are a really healthy food. I do too. Um, but people weren't buying enough of them. And they want to sell more pecans. What's wrong with that? And that's a question I, you know, what's wrong with trying to sell more blueberries? I get asked it all the time. What's wrong with selling pecans? What's wrong with selling strawberries? What's wrong with trying to promote healthy foods? Uh, what's wrong with it is it's about marketing, not science. And it induces distrust of science. It distorts the research agenda. You wouldn't be doing these kinds of studies if it weren't for marketing purposes. The most recent one I've seen seen is mangoes. Um, and it was a study about, and I love mangoes. It was, I really love, I'm a little she alert. Says, she always says that right before she tells you something bad. Yeah, I love mangoes. Um, and this is on, if you eat mangoes, you have less symptoms of constipation than you would if you took a fiber supplement. So I looked at the title of the study, and I thought, who paid for this? Bingo, the National Mango Board. <laughs> predictable, completely predictable by the title of the study because otherwise why would you do a study like that? All fruits and vegetables have fiber and any kind of fruit and vegetable in fiber is gonna work well because it's got bulk and you're eating it as food. Food is always better than supplements. Um, so I think it distorts the research agenda. It gives research a bad name. It gives nutrition science a bad name. And I love nutrition science in all its complexity. Yes, and there's already a, enough of an attack on science and truth, right, oh, happening yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. So we need you out mm -hmm. there, Marianne. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, speaking of you love nutrition science, how did you find yourself following this passion? Oh, I've got, you know, these formative stories. When I was, when I was eight years old, I went to a, I went to a camp in a, um, in a farm in southern Vermont, and the woman who ran, it was a very small camp, and the, the woman who ran the camp was a fabulous cook, and they had an enormous kitchen garden. And I had grown up in New York City, post-war, during the war, we had horrible, horrible food um, that never tasted good and was always, it was one of those things where you had to sat at, sit at the table until you finished it. Um, and it was, if you were a good camper, it was, you were assigned the job of going out and picking the vegetables for dinner. And it was July and it was hot and I was picking string beans, string beans and I thought, I wonder what these things taste like. And 
I picked this string bean off the vine and bit into it, and it was just revelatory. It was sweet. String beans are sweet. It was sweet. It was crispy. It was crunchy. And I thought, oh, I get it. This is what they're supposed to taste like. <laughs> you know, and they're not supposed to taste like the ones that were canned and salted and had all those things done to them. And so that was when I discovered food. Um, and then when I, in my first teaching job, I was given a nutrition course to teach. And it was like falling in love. I was, I was trained, my doctorate is in molecular biology. I was teaching cell and molecular biology, which is very abstract and difficult to teach. And I was given this course to teach and everybody eats and the students were passionately excited about it. It was so much fun, I've never looked back. So what do you think about the nutrition community right now, like the state that it's in currently? And it seems like there's a lot of people too um, with the advent of um, sort of, especially with social media, it seems like there's a lot of people that are also putting themselves out there as nutritionists that aren't. Well, that's always been a problem. Yeah. That's always been a problem. When, when I first started teaching nutrition, uh, Linus Pauling's Vitamin C in the Common Cold had just come out. He had two Nobel Prizes, and he was arguing that if you took 10 grams a day of vitamin C, you would never get a cold and you would never get cancer. Um, uh, wow. Both of which have been unfortunately discredited. I wish it were that easy. Um, so there have always been nutrition gurus going back to the Kellogg's, you know, who were very concerned about fiber and the digestive tract. Um, and the uh, and now we have lots of self-appointed nutrition people who have fun with this sort of thing and sometimes make a great deal of money on it. And all I can say is let the buyer beware, be careful. I mean, really, uh, eating a healthy diet is pretty simple. You know, Michael Pollan does it in seven words, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Really that simple. What do you eat? Eat food mostly, <laughs> not too much, mostly plants. <laughs> yeah, I follow my own advice. I don't have any trouble with it. Um, you know, if I want to eat junk food, I'll eat junk food. I just don't eat too much of it. What kind of junk food do you eat? Well, this morning, <laughs> <laughs> a reporter, not G. No, Monica Eng, who's Monica, amazing. Monica Eng took me this morning to the farmer's market that's around here. Um, and I had a bean pie. We shared a bean pie before. That's why we're, we're smiling so yes. much. Um, there, there was well, a lot of sugar in that bean yeah. pie. She well, ate it. <laughs> with, of course I ate it. I love sugar. The, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, the story about the bean pie is really interesting, as Monica told it to me, that Elijah Mohammed told his followers, so here's another nutrition guru, right? He told his followers that they shouldn't eat sweet potatoes, that that was food for pigs. Uh, wrong. Um, <laughs> lucky pigs. The, um, and so they d instead of eating sweet potato pie, he recommended that they eat bean pie. And so this um, bean pie place developed a recipe for bean pie. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. I thought it was delicious. Yeah, it was good. Thank you for sharing. She's a sharer <laughs> too, everybody. Um, you know, everything you eat, everything in moderation. You get somebody to share your piece of pie. So there are no foods that are off the table for you? Oh, no. Okay. No, no. I mean, really not at all. Um, but small amounts. You know, I think it's, uh, I wrote a whole book called Soda Politics about why sugary drinks are really not good for you. Um, if you're going to do a sugary drink, whatever it is, small amounts. I believe Coca-Cola is going to quote you. You just said, I love sugar a little while ago. And oh, they do. use that they in do. the campaign. <laughs> anyway, there's somebody from Coca-Cola here. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are, you are on the radar of all of these food companies, these giant food companies. Have you ever felt uh, threatened? Have you ever felt? By food companies? Yeah. Uh, only once, and that was the Sugar Association was very upset that about something that I said on the radio in 2002 when my book Food Politics was coming out. Um, I said on the radio that um, sh that soft drinks have sugar and water and nothing else. 
and the Sugar Association wrote me, uh, the, law, the Sugar Association's lawyer wrote me a threatening letter saying that I, of all people, should know that um, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola do not contain sugar. They contain high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> So when I got up off the floor from being doubled over in laughter as you were, um, I thought this is just the funniest thing I ever saw and I sent it around to a couple of people and they said, Marion, they're gonna sue you for defamation of food. You need a lawyer, you need a libel lawyer. You have to send them a complete rebuttal. And so I wrote this very carefully worded letter rebutting every single thing they said. And I, and I never heard anything else about it. And I ran into the head of the Sugar Association at a professional meeting a few months later. And I said, I've posted your letter on my website where it still is, and, and you can read it. Um, I posted your letter on my website. I, I talk about your letter in every talk I give. I've had so much fun with it. Thank you. And, <laughs> and, he, sa and he said, through clenched teeth, we're just being, we're just glad that you're being more precise now. Now I say, uh, sodas have sugars, plural, and nothing else. <laughs> um, I, can you yeah. talk about the, maybe the most outlandish um, solicitation you've ever had from a food company? Have, has someone ever approached you about doing a study for them? Oh yeah, I'm, you know, I mean, food companies would love me to work for them. They would love me to be on their boards. They would love me. I meet with them all the time. Um, and I'm they would a, fly you to an exotic location? They would be happy to, and some of them have. Oh. <laughs> and some of them have. Um, I take travel money, because otherwise I couldn't go. Right. But um, I don't take personal, I don't take honoraria or personal payments. Um, I have a policy, and I try to abide by it. I make them pay, but I don't take the money personally. I donate it to either the NYU library or my department, a fund in my department. Um, I signed the checks over. So. That's very good of you. Uh, no, very necessary. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most outlandish health benefit claim that you've seen? I think they're all outlandish. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. I mean, the idea that if you eat one food, it's going to reduce your risk for heart disease? Does that make any sense at but all? But we buy it. I yeah, do. Yeah, because it's fun. <laughs> it's fun, and it sure sells food products. I mean, I think the, the most outlandish, outlandish ones are ones that don't exist anymore because the cereal boxes have cleaned up their act. But I think the, you know, there were on the, for a while, there was a period when cereal boxes were advertising that if you ate this sh sugar sweetened cereal aimed at kids, it would protect your child's immune system. I actually have one of those boxes, I collect them. Um, and, or, you know, the, the heart disease claims on cereal boxes and that kind of thing. I mean, all of those. If you just think about it, a sugary cereal is going to protect you against heart disease. Um, so, uh, yes, the FDA has approved these kinds of claims because it had to by order of Congress. And it tries to keep them as scientific as possible, but it's a slippery slope and they're a mess. Well, I think all of them are misleading. Well, I was going to ask you, follow up to that. Um, we have you obviously on our side looking out for us and educating us. Um, but what about the National Institute of Health and the USDA and the FDA and the American Heart Association, larger organizations that we look to that we think, oh, we can trust these folks? Well, we can trust them more than we can trust some other ones. But in every single one of these, there have been incidents in which they have been susceptible to the same kind of influence that is always exerted by food. And I, and I have to say that the business about influence is very difficult to talk about because and there's an enormous body of research on this, and the research says that the influence is exerted as an un, at an unconscious level. People don't realize they're being influenced. They didn't intend to be influenced. They're not being overtly bought. They don't realize that this is going on. It makes it really difficult to deal with. 
Um, and so we have, just in the last few months, um, an incident in which five large alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverage companies, makers of whiskey and beer and other kinds of alcoholic beverages, gave the National Institutes of Health $67 million for a study to demonstrate the benefits of one drink a day. <laughs> it wasn't quite phrased that way, but the reporter for the New York Times who did the investigation of this got emails that demonstrated that the investigators at NIH had essentially promised the alcohol industry that their, the study, when it came out, would show benefits and would not show that alcohol raised the risk for breast cancer, for example, because they weren't going to run the trial long enough for that to show. And so here are these emails from this investigative reporter that this investigative reporter got that show collusion between the NIH and the alcohol industry to do a, an, a very important clinical trial that was being run at Harvard, I think, uh, that was guaranteed from the get-go to show that one drink a day would reduce your risk for heart disease. When these stories came out, the NIH did an investigation. The report of the investigative committee was scathing, and the NIH stopped the trial. Um, so, doing these kinds of things gets you in trouble. That's another. That's an, that's another thing. So that's NIH. There have always been criticisms of the Heart Association, the Cancer Association, and so forth. That they have collaborations and pro partnerships with food companies of one kind or another. I think it's a slippery slope. And if they could avoid it, it would be better. Um, and the FDA um, seems to be as much as it can staying out of that with only, even now, the FDA seems to be off the radar um, of the politics of the current administration. So far, so good. But even there, the one thing that comes up is that in their advisory committees, they are very generous in allowing experts with conflicted interests to serve on advisory committee. And you know, there, there's a situation where if you're, I think I give an example in the book of a of the female sex drug, which is one of my favorite all-time examples, a drug that was demonstrated in clinical trials not to work. Um, and the company that made it organized a front group of women demanding that they be allowed to take this drug. The FDA caved and approved it. And so uh, that was in the previous administration's FDA. Um, and so these things still happen, but and you keep an eye on them, but there are a lot of reporters who are keeping a very close eye on it. Um, I'm going to end with this question to you, because I think that we're going to then go on to audience Great. questions. So Can't cue wait. up your questions <laughs> in your mind. Um, so obviously, I know better now because of you, and you've enlightened me. So when I go into the grocery store and I hear a study, I'm thinking about it um, much more critically. Um, but what is it about us that makes us want what is it about the human condition that makes us want to believe this? Like, I mean, as soon as I hear that a food is going to be better for me than this other type of food, I want to go out and buy it. And I want to go get the supplements, even though taking too many supplements could harm you. I have a friend who now is on this craze of um, charcoal. Have you guys been hearing about this? Drinking, you're mixing charcoal with water, and you take it, and it detoxifies you. I have another friend who's obsessed with turmeric, because turmeric's going to help her with her inflammation. Mm -hmm. What is it about us? Why are we, we want to go with every new diet. We want, the keto diet is now big again. What, what's wrong with us? Why are we like We're this? <laughs> We're human. This is how humans think. Humans, every human society has invented religion. The religions aren't necessarily the same, but every human science, society has invented religion mm -hmm. um, with very little scientific evidence to back it up. Um, and this is the same kind of thing. This is, it's a different part of the brain. It's not cognitive. It's emotional and it's subconscious. And that makes it very, very difficult to 
deal with. Um, so we're susceptible. We're susceptible. We're susceptible. To Absolutely. This. We're all influenced by these things. We go into a grocery store and see some ridiculous, highly processed product with a health claim on it, and we think that's good for us, and we buy it. Um, and of course, the marketers are totally familiar with this research. They invented it. They've done it themselves. They know it really, really well, and they know how to use it. And so I try to explain to people, this is about marketing. It's not about science. Wow. You're amazing. OK, I'm going to let you guys ask questions now. Um, OK. Oh, look at all that. Wow, yes, Ooh, lots of questions. Fun. There's a mic. It's coming around. We'll try to get to everyone's question. I like how very tall and high you put your hand up. That's very good. Yeah, very and good. wave it frantically, yes. and you'll get more attention. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so me and my friend were dietitians, like clinical dietitians. Uh -huh. um, and I'm wondering what you think, I also have a passion for food politics, I'm wondering what you think the role of like clinical nutrition is in food politics. Does it have a role? Um, you know, are we needed in the food oh, politics world? Oh, you're needed so badly. <laughs> yes, dietitians have a role. I wish that you could do something about your society. <laughs> <laughs> The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics is unfortunately infamous for its close relationships with food companies. And I write about this in this book, and I wrote about it in Food Politics. And um, I wrote one of my, the, my rationales for writing Food Politics in 2002 was that I hoped that what was then the American Dietetic Association would stop allowing food food companies to sponsor their fact sheets on different issues in about food. They had a set of fact sheets on various questions about food and the food system, and you could predict by the what it was about, who the funder was. They had food companies funding every single one of those. They did eventually stop that, but not for several years. But they did eventually stop that. So that's good. Um, and there is within the what is now the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics a, um, a group called uh, dietetics for Professional uh, Responsibility, which I think is disbanded, unfortunately, um, which had as its goal cleaning up issues related to food company sponsorship of the academy. And the reason that it's a concern is that, oh, I hate to pick on Coca-Cola, but they do make it easy. Um, <laughs> Coca-Cola paid dietitians to promote Coca-Cola as a snack. Seriously. Um, and what these dietitians would do would be to go on social media and write things about have a Coke in the afternoon and this kind of thing. I mean, it's hard to make this stuff up. Um, so until the, the Dietetic Association has tried, I think, reasonably hard to set up some guidelines for um, the companies that they'll take money from and the, that sponsor them. It's now a very short list. And the companies that they are, that they allow to exhibit at the expo that they have with the annual meeting. And I'm told by my, sp I didn't go to the expo this year, but I'm told that my spies who were, by my spies who were there, that it's much more subdued and much, much better than it was a few years ago, although the Sugar Association was still there, giving out unbelievable coloring books and other materials, which I have copies of. They brought me copies. Um, trying to explain that vegetables taste better if they're sweetened with sugar. Oh, my goodness. They do. <laughs> that's, that's an entirely other area, marketing towards children. Right. Yeah. So, yes, you have a role and, uh, and a very important one. And if your ethics, ethical standards are high, you'll do much better. Um, we have a question. I think you are extraordinary, and Thank you. I um, bow to you. You're um, here. We all do. Your expertise, your intelligence, your ability to be louder, please. If you're going to say such nice things, <laughs> if you're going to say such nice things, I want to hear every word. <laughs> As I have shared, the one reason that I would choose to live in New York versus just visiting 
would be to be able to attend any kind of lectures that you have given on a regular basis. That Thank said, you. my question, um, and I'm going to make it a question versus a statement, is that the risk of having one drink a day, having a having any amount of alcohol raises the risk of breast cancer for women. And I have spoken to internists and OBs in regard to this, and they have said, yes, it's true. Why, then my next question, and I try to be subtle, but I have difficulty with that, is why don't you share that with every patient? And the answer, a variation of that answer is, I don't want to alarm or I don't want to, I want them to be able to come back to me and ask other questions. I want them to feel mm -hmm. comfortable. And yeah, the alcohol situation is complicated, and there are studies that show that. However, the risk of one drink a day, the increase in risk of one drink a day is extremely small. It really doesn't get serious until you start having two or three drinks a day. Good um, to know. Good to know, yeah, Marianne. So, and, <laughs> You know, and so, yeah, alcohol is a huge problem in our society. And it's not a huge problem for everybody, but it's a huge problem. And the objective, the public health objective in alcohol is to get the amount of alcohol that is consumed by the entire population, on average, as low as possible, because there is a direct proportion of problems, of alcohol problems, in proportion to the level of alcohol consumption in the population. Population. The lower the alcohol consumption across the entire population, the lower is the risk of having alcohol abuse problems. So less is better. Um, and then the real question is, what about that one little glass of wine? Um, it's very hard to demonstrate any kind of enormous harm from that. Um, I mean, so doesn't red wine have antioxidants that will help me? Have, yeah, right. I heard in a study that one glass of red wine... And guess who funded that study? <laughs> um, yeah, they have flavanols, too. Um, yeah, the, um, and, and so that makes it, from a public health standpoint, um, social drinking is you know, so much embedded in our society. We tried teetotaling. It was a... Um, political disaster, an absolute disaster. Um, nothing like that will ever happen again. And the um, and so that so there there are other considerations besides public health that come to, into it that make the alcohol situation really difficult to deal with. So I think along her, the lines of her question, why doctors may not say that to their patients is they they're taking that all into consideration. So yeah. they don't make it a policy and, to say you know, that. and it's and it's small. It's not like cigarettes. Um, you know, cigarettes are really easy to talk about. Just don't smoke. Um, that's a big difference from just don't ever have a glass of wine. Um, you know, if we could, for people who really are moderate drinkers, uh, there's just not a lot of evidence. There's some. Um, and from a public health standpoint, you want, you're worried about breast cancer, don't drink. Don't drink. You want to take a little risk, it's a little risk. You're going to have to do another book on vaping. That's the next new frontier. No, other people are doing that. <laughs> I don't need to do that one. Um. Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, a few years ago, I read a book by the science journalist Nina Teicholtz called The Big Fat Surprise. Mm -hmm. And she talked also about skewed studies with the kinds of organizations you mentioned, mm -hmm. like the American Heart Association, and came to the conclusion that saturated fat really isn't so bad for us. And I mm -hmm. wonder if you're familiar with her work and mm -hmm. if you agree with that. I'm familiar with her work. Um, and I don't like to talk about her, because every time I say anything about her, she writes a letter and says that a lawyer will be following it up. Um, <laughs> and she's already, I write about her in this book, and we've, we're already dealing with her lawyer. Um, so. I, I, in general, I, 
I think that any time you talk about one nutrient, like saturated fat, you're already talking about something that has nothing to do with the way people eat. Because we don't eat saturated fat. We eat foods containing saturated fat that have many other components in them. And Food fats, without exception, there are no exceptions to this, are mixtures of saturated, unsaturated, and polyunsaturated fat. So when you're eating meat, you're eating several different kinds of fat. When you talk about saturated fat, you're taking fat out, or you're taking one kind of fatty acid out of its fat context, food context, dietary context, di lifestyle context, and it makes no sense at all. It just doesn't make any sense at all. So I think that her concerns about conflicts of interest on the dietary guidelines committees are very well founded. I certainly share her concerns. I don't know what to say about saturated fat at this point. Some studies show that saturated fat raises blood cholesterol levels. Other studies don't. Um, those seem to be independent of the funder, so there's a mixture. Uh, whether it makes any difference depends on what form you're eating it in. If you're eating 20 ounces of meat a day on a routine basis, you're probably eating a lot of other foods that aren't good for you as well because it's the dietary pattern that counts. But nobody eats saturated fat on its own. It's, it's always a mixture. Some foods have more, some foods have less, butter has more, but people don't eat that much butter usually. So I don't know how much you should worry about it. If you follow basic dietary advice, eat a lot of plants, don't eat too much, physically active, I think you're doing fine. Don't worry about it. Love what you're eating. It's one of life's greatest pleasures. Hi, so I have a two-pronged question, and firstly, I was wondering, in your new book, you do Can talk you talk right into oh. the microphone, because I can't hear it. Okay, um, so in your new book, you talk about um, eating whole grains and probably less added sugar, but you don't really address carbohydrates, um, given recent trends such as the paleo diet. Um, what are your thoughts about high versus low carbohydrate diets? And then mm -hmm. secondly, there's uh, a lot of- Let me of, just oh. stop there. My answer to that is exactly the same as the answer before. You're talking about one nutrient. What form are the carbohydrates coming in? What foods are you eating? Are they highly processed? Are they unprocessed? Big difference. And then what are your thoughts on like individual bloggers or people who've been gaining like a fat following? So like Whole30 or like Mark Sisson's Keto Reset Diet? I'm sorry, I just can't hear what oh. you're saying. Um, what are your thoughts on people who have individual blogs, mm -hmm. like who've gained a fat following through their books? So for example, the Whole30, um, Melissa Hartwig, or the Keto Reset Diet, like Mark Sisson, like individual food influencers in the industry, so not food companies. Yeah, I, I'm such a different generation. I never heard of any of those. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I don't know anything about them. Um, people have a right to their own opinion. They can write with the wonderful thing about a, a blog is you can say whatever you want on it, and you don't have an editor. Um, <laughs> I love, that's why I love my blog and keep doing it. I get to say whatever I want. It's my own personal personal rant. Um, so I don't know. You have to pick and choose from the ones you read. If you like them, read them. If you don't like them, you don't read them. I never heard of any of them. Obviously, I'm not reading them. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Different generation. I, I, I want to return to the subject of wine. For men this time, is there any moderate benefit to a glass of wine or red wine, let's say? Uh. That's a different question. Uh, I well, I that's the one I, I want to answer, say, being a man. I would say no. I, I would, you mean physiological benefit? Not that I'm aware of. The, the evidence on alcohol reducing the risk of heart disease has been brought into question lately by new studies that are coming out that are done in a different way and are coming out with different answers. I think it's an open question. When the first studies came out about wine and reduction of heart disease risk, um, 
the alcohol industry in California wanted to put a, a, a tag on wine bottles saying this is a health food. And uh, fortunately, the regulatory agencies for alcohol refused. Uh, so I'm going to say I don't know whether there's any benefit other than social benefit um, for taste benefit for drinking wine. Um, but there's certainly evidence for harm at larger at higher intakes. And in dark chocolate? Dark chocolate? Yeah. Dark chocolate, you have to eat so much of it to get the amount of antioxidants that they're proposing reduce the risk of heart disease um, that your obesity problem would overcome it. And, <laughs> And Mars, and Mars, which is the company that did most of the research trying to link um, cocoa flavanols to reduction in heart disease risk, no longer claims that chocolate reduces heart disease risk. They now have flavanol supplements that they're selling. <laughs> and I've already told you what I think of supplements. Do you, do you take a multivitamin? Oh, no. <laughs> no, I follow my own dietary advice. <laughs> Thank you. I trouble with it. We have time for just one more question, and following this, there will be a book signing out in the lobby. Oh, this last question better be good. The pressure's on. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I'm just wondering where you put slash... The, put the microphone right in front of I'm you. wondering where you slash we get the results of tests that are not supported by industry or sponsored by the industry. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So it. basically, she's looking for um, food science that's not been backed by food, the food uh, industry. Like, where do we go to find real oh, studies? Most studies are not funded by the food industry. Um, just the ones that get a lot of publicity tend to be. Um, every scientific journal these days requires, or at least the good ones, require investigators to disclose somewhere in the paper, usually in a special section, whether who funded the study and whether they have any other financial ties to the funder or the funder's industry. And so all you have to do is go to the original research paper and look it up. And so since you don't have access to those research papers, unless you work at a university library that subscribes to them, as I I am fortunate enough to do, you depend on the journalists writing about the study to say who the funder was. And I have to say that I'm seeing more and more studies reported by journalists who are saying who paid for it. Um, and I think that's a, a big step forward. And I hope that my book will, I have goals for this book. I want consumers to be more skeptical. I want journalists to mention when they're writing about a study that was industry funded. And I'd like the industry to think about what it's doing and maybe back off from some of that. And I'd like my colleagues to set up policies for dealing with industry funding that keep them as free from influence as is humanly possible. Well, Marion, you have enlightened us. You are intelligent, you are passionate, and you are also really funny. And that is fantastic. Thank she you. will be uh, signing books. And maybe you can sneak in a question while she's signing your book when, uh, yeah. Thanks so right. much. Thank for you coming. guys. Thank you so much.